painter I've ever seen. <laughs> and risk is worse than you are. <laughs> I learned 
of the stuff to put it together and took out everything and so it worked for a couple hours. So I worked for a couple hours and after the uh, after that point I looked at as I was going along the copper pot that I was painting and the copper pot was being painted better than I thought I could paint it. Even though I'd been painting still life when I when I you know years ago when I stopped. So I completed this thing and I was fascinated by how good it was. Sal Valdeo walked in, he happened to have a restaurant across the street. And said, what are you doing? I said, I was trying to do a little still life. He said, you know, that looks pretty good. He said, that shows good training. <laughs> 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 Meaning that I hadn't done that in years, and here I am doing this thing. Uh, so I got fascinated then. I, I, I set up a bigger Turkish copper pot and, and uh, various uh, ceramics, and, uh, and I became fascinated with the surfaces of the objects. And uh, so then I went on to do pieces like that and uh, in the, in the fish painting down there. And I was amazed that it looked like I had been doing it all along. Mm -hmm. Like I had not uh, been doing something else. And at first, it you know, kind of puzzled me that, uh, that it was that good, as if I'd been doing it all along. But then I realized was something else that I've been doing all along. And an artist does this. You, you're, you're an observer. And I've been observing all that time. Observing painters in museums. I never looked at a sergeant without analyzing what he was doing. Or Zorn. Or, or uh, uh, you know, any one of the, the greater painters. I was always analyzing what they were doing consciously or unconsciously. If I was looking at objects, I was looking at the way the light on the object. So all of this is being stored in the subconscious and has nothing to do with the hand. It has to do with what's up here, which comes out from the hand. And, uh, and what was up there now was all flowing out. So I did the still lives for, uh, I don't remember how many years, but I, worked, I, haven't been, I haven't done them now in a while. Until I came to a point where I felt I was no longer fascinated. And that's the way it is with all of my painting. I will do something uh, until it stops exciting me. And then I'll move on into another direction very often into a direction that I'm not sure where I'm going. And you might fail in the beginning, not throw the canvases away. But then you get a, you begin to realize what it is that you're working with. And, you, and you're always working with the same elements. Whether you are working realistically or you're working abstractly, every composition is an abstract composition. And the same elements that go into a realistic picture, meaning arrangement, is also going to be an abstract thing, it's a question of arrangement. In fact, that's what everything is, is a question of arrangement. <laughs> you arrange flowers, you arrange your living room, <laughs> you know, with the colors and everything else, you arrange the way you dress, and when you come to do a painting, it's a question of arrangement. And the more sensitive one becomes to color, shape, line, form, the more harmonious the arrangement.
funny part about it was I went to another gallery and went through the same routine. They look at me and they say, he looks like a painter, and uh, what do you do? I paint abstract art, he's got abstract art, is out. Three of them did that right in a row, abstract art was out. Meaning, they sold all the abstract art that they could to their collectors, and now they had to move on to something else so they could sell some more work. goes into being the wife of an artist. She's the business, she keeps track of things. <clears throat> I don't know if she cleans your brushes or not, but no. uh, <laughs> I know you, could, you wouldn't be where you are if it really wasn't for her.
then on the other hand, he does all the work that he doesn't like to do, you know, to keep them going. Uh, most artists don't know what happened to their paintings because they don't keep proper records and files and so on. So you put paintings in galleries and you forget that you didn't take them all back. But no, so our galleries have told me this. And they end up collecting a lot of work in that way. Any other questions? with this one directly behind you because it's so vivid. And, and I know it's difficult to work with such bright, you know, colors. Now, what was your approach on that? And, and well, I, I started this piece in, uh, in black and red, but it wasn't quite that red. Then it occurred to me that if I took a particular color, Then, then, it, uh, then, of course, then I worked on it after I, 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 
can't do an improvisation if you're a dancer or a musician and so on. You can't let the flow stop. You just have to go on spontaneously. And there are days when it doesn't work. <coughs> when, uh, if, you, if you get to a point where you stop and, and you go back to it the next day, how do you get the flow again? Well, or don't you? Some, usually I don't work on it the next day. I will leave look, uh, usually. I will let the painting sit and I will look at it, look at it, and then one day, it might be two days later, three days later, could be two weeks later, I say, ah, I know what that means. <laughs> Words I didn't know before that. And uh, a painting maybe that I didn't think was that good. Once I said, ah, I know what it means, and that's what, what would do the trigger. And from then on, I'll flow again. Okay. But uh, you know, we talk about inspiration. Sometimes it's talent. some reason you become interested in something, in painting something, whatever. That interest makes, creates concentration. And that creates energy. That creates involvement. And uh, if the interest isn't there, nothing happens. <laughs> you know, the energy isn't there, the concentration isn't there. And it's gotta have, it's gotta be natural. You can't force the concentration. And so, so it's very important say, oh, I think I'd love to paint that. On the other hand, there are, I know, I can wake up in the morning, uh, as I've done in the past, with a great idea that I dreamt about when I have to sleep. And I say, oh, this is going to be marvelous. Uh, and then I go to the canvas and I try to put that idea down and find out that it's not marvelous. And from that, I coined the phrase that said, don't let a good idea get in your way. <laughs> Because if you stick with that idea, you're going to go nowhere. On the other hand, you can start with that idea and realize that if you go off on a tangent from it, you could do something. But if you insist upon sticking to that idea, so ideas are very small. Uh, creativity is large, but ideas don't amount to much. That's why I'm from the old school. I don't believe in concepts. I don't believe in concepts because a painting is a painting and a concept is a concept. And when you try to put the two together, unless you move away from the concept, if you let the concept stay with you while you're painting, it's holding you back from that flow that's got to take place. But if you start with the concept and then don't hang on to it, it's like not hanging on to that bad idea <laughs> you know, or that little idea. You're going to do something big and it can't come from that little thing. So you have to let it happen. And on days when uh, you really don't have anything to say, it doesn't happen. You know, I mean, you don't get excited about something. And uh, uh, when you get bored, it's time to move on to something else and not persist with what you're doing because boredom does not produce concentration, <laughs> you know, and so on. And uh, either you don't paint that day or you move in another direction that you, might, you think you might be interested in and so on. And uh, that's, the, that's been my approach. It has to be approached also where there's no fear. You don't worry about whether it's going to be good or bad. Uh, when I would do an abstract thing like that, I look at sometimes when I, I, I pour some paint on and I say to myself, well, that's nice, but nice isn't good enough. Now, if I take some white or whatever, and we get the right consistency, if I pour it right across the canvas and, and I hit it right, it's going to be great. But if I, if I miss it, it goes over to the left or the right, I've lost the painting. Better lose the painting than have a nice painting. <laughs> you know. So that's the way it used to be with that kind of painting. Now when you're doing a still life, it's a whole different matter. Because this is a question of not spontaneity, it's a question of building. You start off by making an arrangement, you push it around until you get it where you like it, and then you render it, you copy it, you copy the actual still life, and you may make changes on it when you're going along. But basically you've got set up for you. And if you're qualified to draw and render it, uh, you, with enough days behind it, it took six weeks to paint. See? And we could paint that in one sitting and then maybe do a little touching up here and there in another sitting. You know? and, but that doesn't mean true of everything. I mean, uh, this one I painted on uh, three, three different times and then put it away looking at it until I realized that I could do 
Sunday style. That's his limitation. <laughs> <laughs> From that, I decided that everybody had limitations, except that some people had more limitations than others. <laughs> Done a lot of teaching? Uh, no. Uh, when I was younger, I needed money. And so I, I, and I had a studio at the west end of town, so plus the studio in my house. I had a room that was the whole first floor of a house that didn't have walls in it. And so I, uh, I advertised and got a dozen students uh, the first year, and then I did it the second year, and then I did it the third year. In the meantime, I had drawing classes. I have 
when you think back on it. But that's the way I used to think spontaneously. I said, don't worry about it. She came back in, in awe, and she had an envelope in her hand. She said, I found this on the subway on the floor. So I picked it up, and there was money in it. And I went like this to see if somebody had dropped it. There wasn't anything, there wasn't any writing on it. And it was $90. <laughs> and what did I say? I said, I was fooled. It didn't have any sense. <laughs> you know, I said, I told you. And that has happened repeatedly in my life. That the money was there when it was needed. When, and finally, uh, it took many years, but Grace finally stopped saying, you know, we only have, <laughs> because she knew there wasn't going to be a problem. That the money would be there. And uh, if I uh, got short, I talked to this thing called God. I get short, I said, look, I, I need this amount of money, which is more than I need, normally need. And, uh, and there's no reason why I shouldn't have it, because it's a legitimate thing that I need it for. It's not some selfish act that we're going to waste money. So I expect to have it. And it will come. That amount will come. Not more, not less. And so on. Uh, sometimes I get a little greedy. And I say, you know, I'd like a little extra. <laughs> Stop worrying about when it's going to come in, you know, and so forth. But that that never happened. The extra did not come, but, but I can't complain because I, the amount needed was always there. It never failed once. We were going to go to the Middle East, remember? And my mother was paying for the trip because my people came in Lebanon. And she wanted me to meet relatives that I, that I had never seen. So when we went to
there other artists in your family? No. My father died when I was seven years old. They claim he played the clarinet, but I never heard it. Those were, those were hard years. He was only married a short spot. Uh, he was only married seven years to my mother, but he went through a lot of illnesses and so on. And they claim when music was played, he cried, <coughs> which meant he was very sensitive. Now, my mother was not an artist, but she was very good. She could do things. If she needed a, a dress, she made it. If the pattern wasn't right, she recreated the pattern, you know. And so she used to judge the craftsman, she was very good. But, uh, but what, where my desire from my early age comes to be an artist, or anybody's desire comes, because any, anybody doesn't have a desire to do something. I say this to young college students that I happen to know at times, what do you plan to do in life? And they say, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, uh, there's nothing that uh, is driving them in any particular direction. So it's not always the same with everybody. And others who say, what are you going to do in life? They say, I'm a musician. You know, and they're just, that's, what, that's what they are. I, I asked that question because as you were describing your life, it seemed like you didn't take direction well from people <laughs> you know, at school because you knew what you wanted and you, you had a well, natural I knew, ability. I sensed. If a thing, at, at times I sensed when it wasn't good, when it wasn't right, when it could be better. And so I questioned it, whereas someone else might have just gone through the process and he didn't question it. And in questioning it, I learned there was something else that was better and, and would, could move in that direction. And that's what I meant about the same kind of questioning goes on. And you find that out by being honest with yourself the next day, by walking into the studio and saying, no, 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 don't fool yourself, that's not a good thing. So, something else. Hey, you know, uh, many years ago, I spent a great deal of time in Spain, and Granada oh, yeah. was one of my favorite places because of the flamenco. Yeah. Yeah. The spirit that you have captivated in that painting
Today, to get somebody to pose for a long time is very hard. If they're poor, they haven't got time because they've got to make a living. <laughs> if they're rich, they don't want to sit. <laughs> so, 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 and I did that with some of the still lives. I used to take all of them. We were going to Florida with that, and I took all the still life material in boxes to Florida in a van. And then I set it all up there, and then the next year I did it again, and I said, that's when I, did, that's when I decided Pick out the best one instead of just any one that I set up. And then blow it up so it's as large as the still life is almost. Uh, and, uh, and it works. Now, it probably wouldn't work for a lot of people. I go and paint a landscape. I mean, if I take a photograph of a landscape and I actually want to copy it like it is, it ends up looking like I painted it on the spot. That's because it's painterly. Uh, if you don't have that outdoor painting experience, if you don't have the experience of working you don't develop that painterly quality. It looks like you copied a photograph. Yes. And uh, so I painted lots of still lives, you know, in my early years from the still lives. I painted the landscapes from the landscapes. Uh, and uh, so I had that background where I didn't have to go out anymore and be bitten by mosquitoes. <laughs> but then I'm improvising anyway on the landscapes. So uh, I'm not sticking. Do you have any more? <laughs> Thank you so much, Ray. It's wonderful to see you. I walked in to see your show, and I was very blown away, overwhelmed. And it wasn't until I turned around and I saw these two abstracts that you spoke so beautifully about. Um, for people that don't know me, my father's Lakota Sioux from Pine Ridge Reservation. Nation. <laughs> the Good Horse Nation. Oh, Good Horse Nation. Yes, yeah. the Good Horse Nation. Right. And I know that art is to be interpreted by the viewer. Yeah. Uh, they certainly look like mother and child to me, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it was very beautiful. And uh, my people also say that um, it takes a lot of courage. It doesn't take any courage to have a vision. It takes a lot of courage to bring the vision to the people. Yeah. And boy, walking in here to see all of your beautiful dreams and visions and the, the, just the, the uh, versatility, I couldn't think of the word, uh, just the versatility is just wonderful. Thank you, thank you. I'm so proud to be here and to honor you and to be able to have it. And I have to, have, I have to thank Chris for giving me this opportunity to show you all what I've been doing. I have to thank Pam. it up because 